Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to uh, hear Mark Essen speak today, tonight. I'm uh, Ido Stern. I teach here. Um, and <laughs> I'm introducing Mark. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to read Mark's bio, and then I'll say a little bit um, some other things. So Mark Essen is an independent game designer and artist who ties with ties to both the games industry world and the newly emerging world of art games or indie games, um, characterized by pixelated animations and graphics, Messhoff Games, which is um, the company that um, Mark and Christy um, are. <laughs> um, Messhoff Games look like, quote, retro games from the 80s, but play like the most advanced games out there. Um, Mark teaches, no, this is the wrong one. Um, Mark uh, received an MFA from UCLA's Design Media Arts Department and studied um, film and what else at Bard? Uh, Did you say? Film, and media arts. film and media arts at Bard. And uh, um, he created many independent games under the label Messhoff, such as Fly Ranch and the IGF and Indicate award winning Nidhog, and soon coming out Nidhog 2. And some of my favorite games of Mark's that I hope he's going to show today are The Thrill of Combat and The Punishing. And then there's another sequel to The Punishing, right? Punishment, the punishing. <laughs> um, and uh, one thing I, I like to think about those games is um, they're sort of conceptually hard. So Mark kind of uses difficulty and uh, impossible, the sort of frustration of, of success uh, very acutely in his games. I'm never able to play these games. I'm basically always, uh, we, I played with Mark a few times and it really didn't work out well. Um, but I find this to be something really um, unique to Mark's game is that difficulty um, is, is almost a, um, a hallmark of, of these games. Um, another thing about Mark's games that really shines is the, the interface and the crispness and attention to control over the games um, really is almost unmatched in, in games, in indie games especially. So the games really become um, an extension of your reflexes and I know speed is something maybe that one could talk about your games. There's sort of a, they're almost operating at a, a microsecond level of detail and I know Mark is very attuned. So. I, you know, I, I remember you got, when, when you were a student here, you went out of your way to get special keyboards that don't have any delay time, that no one else really understood that there was delay on the keyboard buttons being pressed. But Mark notices these things and uh, went out and got some, what were those keyboards? <laughs> yeah, you could press more buttons. Though. Yeah, and you could press many buttons simultaneously. So there's something um, very unique to some of these um, attentions that really serve the games well. Uh, I guess just to wrap up, Mark's work's been exhibited all over the place, both in art venues and game venues. Um, the more arty venues, with places like the Pompidou Center in Paris, File Festival in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the New Museum in New York, uh, MoCA in Toronto, FACT in Liverpool, Dam Festival Berlin, and um, many other places. So. Please help me welcome Mark, and uh, excited to see you. Thanks. Thank you for the intro. Uh, and thank you, everybody, that's helped put this on. Thanks, Brenda. And uh, thanks, Eric, for showing me around all day. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. OK, so I'm Mark. That was a better intro than I could have done. Uh, I went to school here in 2010, graduated 2012. Um, yeah, so I make video games, and I have for a while. This talk sort of encompasses the past 10 years of my life, so, or my life in games, um, pretty much chronologically. Um, so hopefully that's interesting. I don't know if there's like necessarily a takeaway or like, I don't know if there's any logic to it exactly. I just tried to show like as many projects as I could. Uh, 
But uh, right now, uh, Christy and I have a company that we started a few years back. We've put out a couple games that you might have seen. Um, we have a game called Nidhogg that's on uh, Steam, PlayStation, and the handheld PlayStation Vita. Um, we put out a game called Fly Wrench, which was like an update to an older game that I'll talk about on the slides. Um, and that's on Steam, and it's coming out on PlayStation soon. Um, yeah, right now, the way I make games is a lot different than 10 years ago. Um, right now, I have a person, Christy, that handles business development and a lot of the uh, deal making and relationship building that you need to sustain as a company like this. And uh, we also have a host of other people that we bring in whenever we can. Uh, we have musicians we like to work with. We have a full-time PR company right now helping us, um, a full-time artist. These are all off-site people that we work with over the phone. Uh, so our artist is based in Toronto. Our PR company is in Vancouver. Um, we have a video guy in San Francisco, uh, a programmer in the Ukraine. Um, who else? Programmer in Florida. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's pretty eclectic, uh, and I guess our design philosophy, like Ida was saying, is uh, we like these deep, difficult games, or potentially difficult you know, games with a low barrier to entry but high skill ceiling. Um, you always hear this phrase, like, easy to learn, hard to master, and we still kind of try to make games with that in mind, but maybe using more uh, different um, subjects, like more, anyway. <laughs> and we, we, make, we do a lot of prototyping. Um, we like to throw things away. We mostly throw everything away. Um, we're constantly like taking pieces out of our games and putting new pieces back in. And so sometimes the projects can drag on for quite a while. Uh, Nidhogg, for instance, I think it was started in 2009, and it came out in 2014. Um, and that was just a long iterative process, partially uh, roadblocked by things like needing a job and paying rent and stuff like that. Um, and we like to make games that are fun to watch as well as play. Uh, we don't really want to gear our games fully towards like a gamer audience. We want them to be um, able to be appreciated by anyone that might have seen a game as a kid but hasn't played a game in 20 years. Um, I, we love esports, so we love thinking of games as you know, within the context of like a sport and how do you appreciate a sport as a fan and not as a player. Um, so yeah, so before all that, um, I'll talk about all these little games I made. Some of them as, you could call them like art pieces because they were shown as art pieces, but mostly it was uh, just a hobby of mine and just a way to like think through uh, game design. Um, and so, yeah, as Ida was saying, Messhoff was a moniker I've used online for 20 years or something. And so that became the brand for these games. And later when we started a company, we decided to keep the same name uh, just to continue that brand. So it's a little confusing in that way. Uh, but Messhoff, you know, in this early period meant me. Messhoff later means like all of our collaborators and Christy and everybody else. Uh, okay, so this is a game I'm sorry about the quality. This is a game called Bool. Um, it's, uh, made in a, it's sort of made in response to games that over tutorialize, and you have to like wade through walls of text and menus before you actually get to the game that you wanted to play. Uh, so in this game, it's hard to see, but all the text is not English. It's just this made up language. Um, maybe <laughs> So when you boot up the game, you die pretty quickly, and then you start to learn the controls because nothing's mapped out ahead of time. All the menus are in this language, um, and it doesn't take long to figure out what you're meant to do. Um, and over the course of the game, you can buy upgrades to your ship that let you like, stay in the air longer and uh, you know, move this little ball down further to pick up things from the ground, better shields and whatnot. That's balanced against buying upgrades to actually learn how the game works, because there's an upgrade that lets you decode the language bit by bit. So, also sort of you know, just inspired by playing uh, Japanese games that were never translated, just like trying to figure out what the hell is going on. 
And then this game is... It's not the music. I was trying to find the video. Uh, so anyway, that's not the music. But it should come up in a minute. Okay. Yeah, this is called Punishment, The Punishing. It's a sequel to a game called Punishment. Uh, and this one's all... It's sort of a masochistically difficult game. Um, so it's a platformer, like a Mario or whatever. Um, but the, it's super tarred. You can see that there's a lot of uh, slip, slipperiness to the controls. Um, the platforms are pretty small. They get incredibly small. You can see on the top right. Um, and then the idea is, it's also a game sort of made in response to all these games that inflate their uh, gameplay time by utilizing backtracking or like fetch quests, where you get to a new zone and the guy asks you, hey, you've, to get through this door, you need a key. And you remember seeing the key, you know, back where you started. So you have to backtrack all the way there, and then go all the way back to unlock the door. So in this game, every time you get to a new screen, you have to wade your way back to the first screen to flip the main switch again, which because it gets reset. Um, and then there's multiple switches in each room that you have to flip. <laughs> um, so How many screens are you up to that last video? Like. Two no! I wish I could mute one video. Why am I trying to get on that one? I get on this one. Uh, anyway, the, the one on the top hey, is look, the guy. Awesome. That's the final screen I he's got. And he's already played it once before because you have to. Oh, he's already seen it once before. So you have to jump on these series of like one pixel wide platforms. We can grab the pole. You have arms. And then. Do something. Be more useful than what you want. You have to time this oh, phasing I thing. Gonna... <laughs> Dang it! I knew they were gonna do something like that. That's really lame. Uh, I'm freaking. All right, this game is called "You Found the Grappling Hook." Uh, here's the trailer. Um, this is like playing a game as though you play you were playing a game like Metroid or something. Um, where there's obviously a cool part, and you wade through all this like, skill building stuff to get there. There's like, you know, 10 intro levels, and then you're learning the story and all this stuff. Who cares? What well, if there's a game where it just started when you got that cool item? So, I don't know. I thought grappling hooks were cool. So, it's just, it's a very simple game about swinging on grappling hooks. Uh, there's a little bit of a twist at the end. Uh, you get a new item, and then you have to, let, you get a pickaxe at the end, and you have to go back through the game in reverse, trying to mine gold. <laughs> um, all the platforms are made of gold, so you try to like take apart the platforms uh, and then get out before the cave collapses. Um, and then the, it's kind of, the reason I included it was because um, at the time it came out, there were a lot of websites covering indie games and business, places like Business Week were opening indie games arcade sections in their newspapers, their virtual newspapers. Um, and they hotlinked my file, so I thought it'd be a fun, a fun thing to do if people that didn't know about indie games downloaded this new version of the game, uh, unbeknownst to anybody. Anybody. So this is. Uh, Hello. You found the grappling hook pro edition that you would get play. if you, you found, found this game on hook. Business Week. I don't know anything about this game. I've been told it's not a screamer. If it is a screamer then I'm going to be pissed off at the person who told me it wasn't a screamer. Huh. Alright. Don't know the controls. There we go. Spacebar jumps. I'm a... I'm a... Gonna see if I could fast forward the video, but I guess I can't. Uh, all right, well, maybe I'll come back to that. But anyway, you go into this office and you have to like read out terrorist sus suspects in the Business Week cubicles and answer questions about Business Week articles to keep your cover. Uh, <laughs> but it was sort of a long video, and yeah, I thought I could skip ahead. Sorry. Uh, this is a game I made in college it's called Randy Balma Municipal Abortionist. It's a sort of a surreal adventure where as you progress uh, through the levels, 
your character changes and you get more and more control, uh, eventually becoming this baby squid. Uh, the, the scenes are kind of jumbled up, but like in one scene you might be driving a bus and the controls are switching all the time. Um, in the scene you're trying to knock out all the satellites. Um, you're flying clock. Um, and as you lose pieces, it becomes really difficult to uh, keep them rotating completely. floating around in zero G and you're trying to get these little flashing balls but you have to jump off of these heads So I made a lot of games in this period of, about helicopters picking things up. I was fascinated for some reason, and I think this week when thinking of this talk, I kind of traced it back to a toy I used to have growing up. So like even the thrill of combat was all, I think they're all kind of inspired by this toy. The bank robbers are getting away. Birdie Bird Air Police Chopper takes off. Headquarters has them on the screen. They're turning south onto Route 5, and you're after them. You drop the roadblock and go for a hookup. Now you move it forward, steady it, and lower it. You've got them. Now you bring them in. 10-4. The Verdi Bird Air Police comes with everything you see here. This is it's new from Mattel. And I made, uh, so I made the Thrill of Combat, which sort of has a similar interface. It's this analog control scheme. Um, it could be played by one player or two. Uh, the guy on the right has the steering wheel, and the steering wheel controls the rotation of the helicopter, like the pitch. And there's also a gas pedal underneath the table, and that controls the throttle. Um, and then on the right, there's a joystick, like a you know, two-way joystick with a button, trigger button. Um, and this game, you're trying to collect organs uh, from this helicopter. So you leave your ship, and you have to people, but it's not about killing people, it's about just like disabling them and then jumping out of the helicopter and cutting out their organs. And then you also have to like, there's two characters in there and they're hard to uh, just avoid these missiles at the same time. I just I wanted to make a really violent game, but I didn't want to make it about uh, you know being super fun to be violent. I wanted to make it like really difficult to be <laughs> effectively violent, I guess. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is like the real time. So anyway, that's the thrill of combat. Um, the music was by a friend of the time, Greg Fox, and I did the 8-bit sound effects. Actually, the, yeah, I don't know why the music isn't playing in this video, but... Uh, and then, uh, after making that, I wanted to make more of a game out of it, or a game that 
more people might enjoy. Or I was just, I don't know, it's still on my mind. So I made this game uh, that's sort of like <laughs> taking elements from that game and rearranging them. And it's now a game about just avoiding missiles and doing some flips with your helicopter. <laughs> After making that Randy Balma game, I wanted to make another remix with some, some of the similar elements from that game. So uh, this, the FACT Museum, or the Foundation for Art and Creative Technology in the UK, uh, commissioned a small game for one of their shows. And this is, this is what I made after uh, reading a lot of like, science fiction. And, uh, it's kind of inspired by Ender's Game, the, the 3D, I'm sorry, the zero G battle they have to go through. here but this was another I guess it was just another game made for a specific exhibit I forget uh, oh yeah yeah I think we showed it in New York um, for just sort of a, a small I don't know a small gallery show I don't remember what the occasion was um, but we I think it was just a reason to build an arcade cabinet which I don't have pictures of uh, so this is like a, it's a basketball game one-on-one -on -one with jetpacks Jetpack basketball. Tried to do more with that one, but then I don't know. I think that's what it was meant to be. Uh, that's the end of that. And, uh, this was another game I made. Uh, this was for a exhibit at the MoCA Toronto. Uh, I had Thrill of Combat on one wall, and then I had this on another wall. Uh, and it's another kind of flight game. I have a lot of flight games. Uh, this is all about building, like the process of building your plane before you fly it. So you have to go through these cavernous areas, collecting scrap, and then you climb these towers and then use the scrap to purchase or to build planes and like outfit them with guns and stuff. And then over time, you can upgrade your plane enough to go above the clouds, and then you have these engaging sort of dogfights, sort of sweet dogfights. Then <laughs> uh, I met uh, I met a musician friend, or I became friends with a musician, and he introduced me to some of his friends from growing up, who now have this company, Pixel Jam, um, and they invited me to do a a project with them. And so I designed a game, and they programmed it, um, and I I did some of the art, not this screen, but I did like the in-game art, um, and so it became a game about a werewolf ice cream man. Um, so it's sort of like a paper boy or something like that, where you're just moving around town, uh, collecting customers, and then after three days, you then rely on those customers to 
the food. So you should eat them. You lead them back to your cave and eat them. But, um. but it's like, it was probably my first like real game that had a big game arc with upgrades and stuff. So this was pretty new to me. Like real upgrades that prevent you, but, you know, sometimes you lose because you don't upgrade properly. Another game. So I, so that was a game made for Adult Swim with that company, and then I met adults, the people at Adult Swim, and uh, I started pitching games of my own. Um, so this was the first of those games. I wanted to make. I was trying to learn how to surf, and I wanted to make a game about surfing, uh, a very slow-paced game about waiting for waves and that sort of thing. Um, but it went off the rails pretty quickly. Um, and it became a game about like eating meat when no one's looking and working a job and a little bit of surfing. <laughs> That is another game. 
Uh, so I did like th I did three games for Adult Swim. This is the second. Uh, probably so the idea was make a racing game that doesn't have any turns or anything. There's no track. Uh, the goal is just to win by like, eliminating, and eliminating other cars. And if you don't finish first, you crash. Uh, you have the opportunity to murder everyone that finished ahead of you. I tell you what did finish. You know, Breaks your thumbs one by one, so you have two lives. Last game I made, it's called Surprise Bullfight. I wanted to make a game about bullfights. I played a great game called Bullfight that was made in 1984, I think. And I just I wanted to I wanted to bring in the renaissance of bullfighting games. Um, Did you get black? Gnome, you have to go hunt the bull and bring, bring home the heart. So you can track the bull by its species or by its footsteps, the prints. So here's the footprints. And of course you get points for picking up the feces. And so it goes on and on, and the bull's personalities change, and uh, it opens up new areas in the map. So I guess this was a turning point. I was so I was showing a lot of these games, um, you know, the ones that weren't for Adult Swim. I was showing a lot of them in galleries and at um, like music venues and just in a lot of different weird venues. Uh, it was some of them were part of the Creators Project and they were just being shown around the world at these awesome concerts and uh, you know we were at, they were at museums and things like that and I was having fun making. Um, interesting, like different interfaces. Sometimes using controllers, sometimes using like you know the steering wheel and everything. And I wanted to, I wanted to get more into making hardware and making just like different, different ways of interfa of interacting with the game. Because you know back in the arcades, uh, oftentimes you'd have like an interface define the game, or vice versa. Not just be so standardized to, you know, not always just use a keyboard, not always just use like a PlayStation controller. So. Uh, I met Ido at Indicade at E3, and he introduced me to some of his work and 
talked about this program, and I think I came and visited and thought it was for me. Uh, I thought I, you know, this would be great, a great way to make more games and progress and think through some, think through some stuff. Uh, so I came here and started making the same stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is a game that sort of slowly turned into a thesis project. Uh, this version was uh, a single player game where you fly a plane around and uh, type out repair commands when you get hit. Um, and then that slowly became a game that was controlled by one keyboard, where instead of using like the arrow keys, you were just bashing on the keyboard uh, as a joystick. So like each quadrant of the keyboard or each slice of the keyboard, if you look down at it like a uh, circle, would be a different direction of the joystick. So if you like bashed at the top, you'd go up. If you bashed on the right side, you'd go to the right. Um, and I, I liked that, and I was really I was uh, learning more about keyboard enthusiasts and like the keyboard world, which is pretty strange. People get really uh, get really into their keyboards. <laughs> so, uh, and some of them they all have you know a distinct sound, and so I wanted to make a game that had lots of these fancy keyboards, uh, and that became this thesis project, Tickle Plane, a six-player game, six keyboards all using that kind of control scheme. Uh, and it's just a big dogfight, I guess. And, it, and as, as you were hit, you had to then switch from typing, or from bashing on the keyboard to actually typing out individual commands. Yeah, so these are the keyboards I used, uh, <laughs> and I used the blue switches up there, so you can see, you can see it all from this little diagram. Uh, you can see the curvature and the uh, actuation point, and you know it tells you how many grams of newtons I guess you need to press into it to actuate the key, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so I got really into that. Uh, and that was the setup. That's my one piece of documentation. I didn't take nearly enough. It, what? Uh, no, it was in the other one, uh, White. I think. Maybe that was here. Not sure. We had it set up both places, but and then this was at the Game Lab Carnival uh, at the Hammer. Um, so then after UCLA, I. Uh, did some collaborations with our friend Chris, or we did some collaborations with our friend Chris, and this was one of them. Uh, I think we were, Christy and I were both playing a lot of StarCraft, StarCraft II, and we were interested in, or I was interested at least in the idea of a st strategy game that was turn-based but also simultaneous. So you pick all your moves, you pick three moves at a time, um, and it's, either, it's a multiplayer game, so the other person's doing the same thing. Um, and then you just see how they play out. Um, and you have certain like special weapons you can only use once. Uh, <laughs> um, and then <laughs> we worked with Chris again making this game called Pukuzi, um, which was a four-player game that was played with special controllers. You had a joystick that you wiggled to move around, and you sat on this special button. Um, and the idea is you're all in this hot tub, and you're trying to sneak poos in the hot tub without being seen. And so it had this physical aspect where you could actually look around and see when they were lift when your opponents were lifting up their butt to poop. Um, And then you could call people out and try to, if you found a turd, you could try to attribute who let, who let it loose.
And so there's all these different, yeah, there's a crazy point structure based on like, if you get it right, if you get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Later on, the jacuzzis get more complex. There's like jets that move things around, so you have to try to think about where it would have, you know, come, <laughs> where the poo would have been laid, you know, with the currents and everything, and try to figure out who did it that way. Uh, pizzas come in later, and you can eat pizzas to do multiple times. You get lots of points if you're falling behind. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm on the Olympics run, and I was watching velodrome racing, and I was trying to get into velodrome racing myself, um, learning about all the different uh, traffic laws <laughs> and such, and so I tried to make a tandem velodrome racing game uh, where two people had to control the same bike and lean the same way, um, because one-on-one -on -one velodrome racing isn't really about speed all the time, it's a lot of it's a mind game where you're trying to actually physically block person behind you from passing you. Um, anyway, this one didn't really work out that well, but I think, so I tried again, and I made this game, which is a one-button game. Um, so the button, if you're letting go of the button, you ride up to the top edge of the track, and if you're pressing it down, you swoop down. Um, and then if it's flat, you can kind of tap it a little bit, but it's not about pressing it as fast as you can. So you can play this with up to uh, six people, just a one-button game. Um, this is FlyWrench. Uh, I made a sort of prototype version in 2007, and then we recently released it last year as a company, as like a very updated version. So this is these are all screenshots from the original. Um, it was a character in Super Meat Boy, if you remember that game. Um, Jonathan Blow, who made the, the Witness and Braid made like a, a remix of it called Nice Wrench that was super easy. But Fly Wrench itself was a super difficult game. Um, an incredibly difficult game. Sort of like Flappy Bird, I guess. Like you can flap your character and then you're trying to match your color to obstacles and walls. the old version, and then this is the new version. Oh no, it's just a GIF. This is the new version. So, uh, just a lot more visual polish, a lot more levels. Um, it has, I don't know, 160 or something levels. Um, we got to work with a lot of collaborators this time. We got we had a level editor or a level designer, uh, Nielsen. Uh, we got to work with a lot of different musicians. Um, huge number of musicians in the soundtrack. It has all these features. Uh, <laughs> um, and I guess in between those games, I was making this game, Nidhogg, which was our, you know, the game that made our company. So uh, this was largely inspired by this game, fencing, Great Swordsman, uh, which was a single player game that I've been playing right. on the, in the arcades, and you've got three um, buttons, or in the you've virtual got arcades on my swing, computer. A middle swing. Oh, look at that. Great. Uh, and it's pretty high, fun. Low, it's like sweep. super slow and kind of weird. Make sure, obviously, that you, um, um, get and your so I was always thinking about here. ways that I might uh, Use some of those mechanics and yeah, like make a new game. The right and, left, there are and I was playing things like Bushido Blade, uh, which is like a fighting. It's like normal fighting game, kind of. But then you can kind of you can run wherever you want and fight in any kind of location. <laughs> There's no point. You just you know. <laughs> Thank you.
I think I, yeah, sorry, I stopped the video there. Hey. Normally a one-hit kill. Yeah, okay. There's certain hits that are one-hit kill. Uh, all right. So then, so I started making a. <laughs> uh, I started making a prototype. It didn't look exactly like this. I couldn't find. I couldn't find super old pictures of it. But um, basically, I had two guys like this on different sides of the screen, and because I usually do these pixel art guys, um, they end up being smaller. Um, so like the ratio of screen space was different, so it ended up being like, you'd either start out far away and have to like inch closer to each other, um, or you'd, after you killed somebody, then you'd have to like back up and with enough for, to give the new guy enough space. Um, and so this is kind of like the way I design now, I just I start with something that I like, and then I see, you know, what's wrong with it, like what's what's throwing off the rhythm. So in this case, like you had to be able to run to close the distance, and so I started letting you run, but then it seemed a shame to make you run in the same single screen. Um, and also, I wanted like enemies to come instead of coming from the same place, because that's where you're standing. They should come from far away, so maybe the edge of the screen made sense. Um, wait. Uh, and then somewhere in here, uh, I met these guys at the NYU Game Center, uh, Charles Pratt and Frank Lance, and they wanted to uh, sponsor the game to be in this exhibition, so um, they gave me a grant, and then I kept working on it. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I just kept designing this way, like saying, oh, well, you know, if you're moving around, if you're running, then you should be able to scroll the screen. If you're scrolling the screen, um, what does that mean? Maybe you're trying to get to one side of the screen, or maybe, you know, maybe there should be different geometries in the way. Uh, maybe there's pits, maybe there's ledges. Um, and then it just sort of became naturally this tug of war game, which is where it ended up. Um, and then from there, there's still a lot of questions like, what happens when one player runs past the other person? Um, you know, you can't catch up, so what do you do? So we added a move where you could throw your sword at them, which would travel faster than running, and sometimes you could hit them, sometimes not. Um, and then, yeah, we just thought of lots of little changes, like, uh, you know, if you're moving your sword into someone else's sword, you could disarm them maybe, and just like lots of little things we tried, a lot of things that didn't work that we took out. Um, and then, so here's what it looked like at that stage at the NYU Game Center show. Oh, he's, oh, oh, jabbed in the, this reminds me of watching Sin City. This dude with all the, just like the yellow and the orange the whole time. Oh my God, here we go. Heavy D, let's see if he can make a difference. Oh! oh my god, he's getting shanked. Really basic, That's correct. Uh, Heavy D is making some. Uh, he's running this. He's running it, dude. He's on Schwarzenegger. He's making some headway. This bridge, though, this, this gap. Is, this it. gap is brutal. He's gonna throw the knife again. So, actually, this was taken not at the game. This gap game is center, brutal. This was actually a tournament. It was part of this mystery tournament. Right, here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh! He fell that, on the sword. People that are really good at like Street Fighter do these in, in person tournaments for cash prizes. And then at this particular place, they had a mystery tournament for the loser's bracket. So if you got to the end of the loser's bracket and then you beat everybody in this mystery game, you'd win the cash prize too. Um, and so this game, so we got our game inserted in there. Um, seems like a great response. And, it, and then we thought, well, maybe we should release this for real and like keep, keep working on it. So a few years later, uh, we did, and I think this is a video. Yeah, so this is what it looks like now. Um,
Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, that's why I put that there. That controller uh, was made by another alumni from DMA or uh, student of DMA, uh, Peter Liu, uh, and it's the cement block on top of a wood base, and uh, we took it to all the shows where we showed Knit Hug, and eventually it got this nice patina around the joystick and the controllers from all the gamer sweat. Um, <laughs> so I still have that, that's nice. <laughs> it's called the slab. Uh, yeah, so then we released the game on Steam, and that was great. And uh, I guess the last thing is we're working on a new sequel to that game, which is a drastically different look. Uh, so this is the first time I haven't done the art, and I'm kind of enjoying it. Uh, we have like a we have a full-time artist as I was saying in Toronto, and uh, I just kind of art direct. So and do the game design and think about all the things we can change. And uh, it's great because we have a big team and we can actually do things quickly. Uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> the end of my talk. That's, that's it. It's coming out soon. So we have some time for questions. Um, I was just told I'm supposed to ask the first question, but I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be yet. So maybe someone else can ask the first question. I'll ask the third question. Um, I heard a rumor that Andy Circus had something to do with the mocap <laughs> in the hug, and I don't know. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It is? <laughs> no. Do you know how that started? Uh, yeah, our friend Craig Adams, who, uh, he's a Toronto guy. He made that iPhone game Sword and Sorcery. I don't know if that's still popular. Um, he, yeah, he, he's a great actor, and he said that as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's really yeah. funny. Yes. And today, lots of like producers they want to make like three D games because they think that's more re uh, like real and real like in reality. So like, why do you always make like two D games with like digital pixels? It's kind of like very old version game, like yeah. art style. Do you think it's your specific art style, or why do you always make two D games? Um. I mean, partially it's the limitation of the software, partially it's the limitation of the artists, like, I don't know, it's what I can do. Uh, I like the look. I don't know if they're all gonna be like that. I think that was a period of my life where I really liked that look and I'm more interested in exploring a couple, you know, different aesthetics now, but um, I think those kinds of games work well if you have like a Twitch game that relies a lot on um, very precise collisions because you can actually see pixel per pixel like where you are. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so a question about Nidhogg specifically. Okay. Do you where do you where do you see the game being played specifically? Is this a game people play at home with friends or in over the internet or in public? And in general, like maybe a broader question, like of all the different arenas that games are happening in now, like mobile games, online games, games in public, mm -hmm. are there particular arenas you're interested in addressing or even creating that don't exist right now? Like, where, I guess, where is, like, for you, the ideal context and place for games to happen? Um, I think ideally not at home and not in a gallery. I think just, I like, you know, the arcade unit where you can just drag it somewhere, wherever that may be. I think that's a great mode. Um, so I, I would like to do that at some point. Um, I do like that games like Nidhogg, there's, uh, I don't know, there's, there have been a few games like this, like local multiplayer games, where even though you're at home, it's a game you wouldn't play alone. You'd normally just play it with a group of friends over. Um, 
or it's a skill-based game that maybe you practice alone, but you go somewhere, like you go to Vegas, to Evo, to play against other people that have practiced all year. Um, so I, I guess, do, do you feel that um, something is lost when the arcades disappeared? And is there a, is there a future for that <laughs> idea? Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, I think there's a chance that that kind of thing could come back. I think the virtual virtual reality arcades are like super creepy. <laughs> it's just like black cubicles and people doing this. <laughs> like there's no spectation. I mean, it's hard to spectate that kind of thing. Yeah, I think um, that's why I ask because I've I've encountered almost all of your games at public events, which yeah um, offer a kind of both the spectacle you're interested in and. Uh, just a different kind of energy and playing with strange strangers and yeah. it seems like that yeah it's a shame I, I mean I feel it's a shame that 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 world is is gone in a in a ubiquitous way but it does seem like games like Nidhogg have really helped sustain and encourage these kinds of festival games or I don't know yeah I mean like the blessing and the curse of digital games is that it's super profitable to like put a game out there and just get royalties from that. But so I think a lot of people don't even approach the arcade scene. I think there are arcade manufacturers that are interested in that kind in finding new content. That's not I mean, a lot of a lot of times now you go to arcades and the new machines are just running like games you played in your iPhone five years ago. Um, so I think there there's plenty of opportunity there that people might not be taking advantage of. Uh, but I don't know if those arcade units would ever like come together in the same space in the way that they used to. You know, it's probably like one arcade at a bar kind of situation or something, which is too bad. <laughs> but. Um, one thing that's a little bit related to the 3D question is that I know like a little bit about um, Game Maker, the tool you use. I can see that kind of a lot of the aesthetics sort of come about as sort of being committed to 2D and the sort of peculiarities of that that particular software for making games as you said mm -hmm. and I think like a lot of like it, like a lot of the visual distinction is sort of like a chemical reaction with your sensibilities and that particular tool and sort of going forward I know you're like a little bit removed directly from working I know you're still coding you said earlier today yeah. but I wonder sort of going forward are you, do you sort of um, put limitations on yourself? Are you trying to sort of, how are you trying to hang on to some of that like visual strength that came from those like limitations? Um, I guess I'm just pushing my limitations onto somebody else and trying to push those boundaries and see where those limitations are and work with that, which is interesting to me because you know that kind of intense collaboration is just totally new, so I'm trying to work it out. But uh, I think I think there's a lot of uh, I think there's a lot you can gain from that. So I'm excited to like figure out what that is. You know. But it's not going to be the, it won't be the same, of course. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, where did you like learn to make games? Is there any like communities or forums that you would go to? Um, yeah, I would go to like the game maker forums, I guess. Um, I think I'm not sure if that's still a thing. If people are helpful anymore, but um, there's a lot more people that have done it at this point. So I think there's a lot of resources you can draw from, just in terms of like tutorials and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also Unity is great. <laughs> I wouldn't I mean, game maker is great for some things, but um, Unity is also great. And I know they teach it here, so uh, you're gonna find a lot more people that are familiar with it. So actually, yeah, to follow a little bit up on the Alex's question, um, so I think when you think of, uh, well, one category that you as a game maker are put in with, with you know, uh, more and more game makers or game auteurs, people who are making games with a personal idiosyncratic, perhaps, approach, but, you know, as as opposed to uh, well, a few weeks ago we had Activision CEO, and this is sort of very much, you know, the industry model of 
hundreds of thou or thousands of people right. <clears throat> developing games by committee and very risk averse and right. um, they all look the same at some point because um, <clears throat> they're successful and the game auteur idea is, is very uh, very attached to the indie game movement and art games and, and this and that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wonder how when a lot of your sort of distinctiveness of your games, I think people think of initially as visual, uh, and then maybe the more they know about them or the more sophisticated they are as players, they recognize an idiosyncrasy in design, in game design, a right. kind of more obscure uh, knowledge or something. And I wonder if you're now changing your role to more of an art director and still very much game design mm -hmm. and sort of leaving the aesthetic hallmarks of your games right. behind, what does that mean? Because it would be very, you know, it's sort of, a, it shifts your focus now so that your creative impact is primarily game design and less game aesthetics, I would imagine. And, and yeah, how does I mean, that it's, it's still, I mean, you know, I talk to the artist every day, pretty much, and we go back and forth about, like, what can he do, what can I do, how can I build something that, or how, you know, him, he'll give me a concept, I'll give him a concept, and we'll try to, like, meet in the middle, um, because a lot of it is still programming, like, the way it works together. Um, but, I mean, this is obviously very different, sorry, this, uh, yeah. Nidhogg 2 looks pretty drastically different than Nidhogg 1, I really, but, uh, yeah, I yeah. would, I would, if I didn't know you made this, I wouldn't. Sure, sure. I wouldn't know by looking at it. Whereas all your other games, the visual is where sort of their their um, initial identity lies. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's been a fun experiment, and uh, yeah, it's not right. It's not recognizable, but I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I just yeah. realized this. It's interesting because. Yeah. But so you don't feel, I, I, I guess what would, I... I think if you saw the two games, yeah. you would probably recognize that it's part of the same world. Right. Um, it has like, I mean, it literally controls the same, so it has a lot of the same visual right. rhythm. But Yeah, more like screenshots, I, 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 maybe. Would, I wouldn't notice. Yeah, that. right. Um, um, well, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an observation, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've had some of the, like the biggest laughs I've ever had in gaming playing Nidhogg, and mm -hmm. like, it's a really funny game. And is that in like is that intentional when you're designing it, like it, that you want it to be funny? And like, wh why aren't games generally very funny, or like <laughs> they do it kind of poorly? Like that, it, it's just, you don't have that many. I feel like you don't have that many uh, moments where you're like laughing out loud, like. I guess maybe because it's such a solitary pursuit, but I was just wondering, right. you know, what you thought about humor in games. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wanted Nidhogg 1 to be funny, and I, I want this to be funny, too. Um, I think a lot of, it's funny, it is funny, because a lot of the fans of the first one uh, were really responding neg negatively to the look of this one, not because it looks different, but because it portrays the characters as, like, not super, not as superheroes, not as, like, crazy masculine ninjas. Um, which I never really thought about. I never thought that these like pixely guys were anything special. We're like, yeah, it's like I think, <laughs> you know, you a lot of people try to. You know, I think a lot of people see themselves as the character, and when you <laughs> when you change that to something else, they get really uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a pixelated silhouette of a figure. Right. Doesn't even, not necessarily man, except that a lot of the sound effects are from a male actor. But <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's fun to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why more games aren't funny. I think they're too 
they're very serious. There's a lot of serious games. A lot of serious gamers out there. That's the problem. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, I have two quick questions. Um, you mentioned um, your design process when making Nidhogg of sort of being conscious of the rhythm of the oh. thing and then yep. when the rhythm breaks. Um, is that something that you're, I guess, how intentional uh, are you when you do that? Is it, are you looking for like a, a period of time that is like a Nidhogg experience or are you looking for like kind of ebbs and flows and that sort of like rhythm of a, of a, of a play session? Um, I guess it's more about rhythm of just like there not being anything interesting happening, you know? So, okay, yeah. like dead spots. Yeah, dead spots. Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah, if I'm just chasing somebody and there's nothing I can do, that's, you know, maybe that's an area that could be improved kind of thing. I see. Yeah. And my other question, sorry, I came late if you haven't sure. already talked about this, but um, I found it interesting, especially with this art style and also the, um, the game you showed as like, the, what was the fencing game called? Uh, Great Swordsman. Great Swordsman. <laughs> like very weird arcade games, right? Yeah. Or like kind of obscure, I guess. Um, and this, this to me looks like like really, really late period, 16-bit or really early, early 32-bit. Yeah. You know, kind of like these moments in um, like tech slash art direction that were very small. Mm -hmm. And then in your, in your racing game, that like raster kind of, right. you know. Um, yeah, we actually have a 3D menu. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I can show you. I don't think I have it on here. Um, is that something that you've like always been into, or is as as you've made games, you find yourself like attracted to like these smaller kind of moments in like like basically like the the strange parts of the Mame catalog, <laughs> so to speak. Oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I've always tried to just go through as many Mame games as I can. Okay. Just because uh, I love the I love the rhythm of these arcade games. They're just like all action. It's like this is the game design. You can have it all. You can have it all at once, um, and I love that. So I've played a lot of old arcade games, and I think the '90s were like a kind of a golden age visually as well as cool. uh, the gameplay. So okay, thanks. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Neo Geo. <laughs> Thanks.